My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran, Guru Sankaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. So today I'm going to start uh, a new topic, the science of meditation. And uh, we have had a lot of discussions uh, on uh, many things, um, you know, mindfulness, meditation and so on. So I thought today we can, you know, discuss more in detail about meditation. Uh, you know, what is it? Why we do it? you know, uh, and, and so on. So a few things I want to cover today. Uh, I want to cover uh, what is meditation. Uh, many people have different perspective of meditation. Uh, what are the different types of meditation that is there? Um, you know, many people practice different types of meditation. Uh, which medi meditation should I choose to suit my lifestyle? So there are different, uh, you know, people have different, uh, you know, um, needs and different uh, you know uh, uh, things that they want uh, to achieve in life and that depends on uh, you know very much so the kind of meditation that will help them uh, and then uh, how is meditation beneficial in our daily life uh, and um, you know uh, and more importantly you know how do we improve uh, our meditation right so sometimes we start really well and uh, you know, we slowly become complacent and we give up. And how do we overcome this? And uh, the other thing is that when we meditate, uh, what are the changes that we see within ourselves? So we have a series of lectures. Uh, I won't cover everything in this week, but we will cover over, uh, you know, many uh, classes, uh, some of these topics, right? So I'm going to... Uh, uh, you know, go slowly on uh, trying to understand meditation and the different practices, uh, you know. So what is meditation? There are many, many definitions of meditation. Um, and basically, you know, it is uh, how we uh, manage our mind. Uh, there are formal definitions and so on. Our mind is a very, very important, uh, you know, tool that nature has given us to function in this material world. So as we've seen in the previous satsangs, we have a hardware, which is the body and the brain. Uh, the brain gets all its stimulus from the sensory organ. Uh, the brain processes as electric, electrical signal, electromagnetic signals through its neural pathway. And then something, a magic happens. You know, we see the world, we cognize the world, and uh, so we have this hardware called brain and we have a software that is nature's blessed us to be able to interpret that in, you know the, the electrical pulse into vision sound feeling all those things and we see that you know as we evolve as a species our brain has become uh, more complex our mind has become uh, more and more complex, and we need the mind to function in this material world, right? So uh, it is an important mode for our consciousness. So the thing is that if we know this, our brain, our body, brain, and mind really well, then we can try to use it effectively to experience this world in the best possible way. So the whole idea of meditation is how do we understand the mind, how do we manage the mind, and how do we enhance our consciousness, our conscious state, and more importantly, how do we realize who we are as a being. So there are many definitions of meditation, and I've just given you a summary of it. But there are different types of practices to really understand the mind, obviously, you know, to understand the body and to understand the brain, we know that we have to eat healthily, we have to keep the body healthy by exercise, we have to make sure we have less stress, all those things we know. But how do we manage the mind? How do we, you know, uh, unlock, unleash the full potential of the mind? So we see that like how the body, if it's to be torn, we have exercise and we take 
you know, good food, and so on. But how do we tone the mind? How do we, you know, exercise the mind to become more subtle, more expansionary, more resilient, and become self-actualized? And these great saints and sages, uh, you know, and great thinkers thought about it, and they started looking at various techniques and methods, you know, to unlock the power of the human mind. So there are various ways of, you know, unlocking the life force that powers our life. You know, they call it chi or ki or the prana. That is the essence of life. And also, how do we essentially, you know, develop emotional state? How do we ensure, manage our emotions, you know, cultivating good emotional state? compassion, love, patience, generosity, forgiveness. You'll see why these, these qualities are so important later on as we go through. So the whole idea of meditation is actually to focus, to enhance our concentration, and to be able to enjoy an inner power, an inner resources that all of us, nature has blessed us. Interestingly, you know, our body um, matures up to the age of 21, and then it starts declining after that. Some of the decline is more rapid than others for people, certain people. But we see that the thing that can really expand and, 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 and continue to evolve is the human mind. <clears throat> and when the human mind is able to evolve and develop even though the body and the brain is aging, you see that the aging process becomes more and more graceful. The aging process becomes more and more uh, enriched experience of this world. <clears throat> so we see that there is a secret to essentially living a wonderful, beautiful life, even though the body is undergoing many, many changes. And this is what the Mahans and others say. How do we manage the human mind? How, how do we enhance the human mind? And by enhancing, how do we enhance the humanly experiences? And that's what, uh, you know, the whole idea of meditation. There are many techniques to do this. But why is this so important in today's world? And you see that, you know, even though we have so much development, so much progress, you see that, our quality of life has essentially, for many people, have gone down. As I mentioned in the previous satsang, how even though we have evolved as a species, we have continued to harm the environment. And that has a major impact on our health, our mindset, our emotional state. Many people live a very stressful life. You know, they wake up in the morning, go to office, come back, a lot of stress in the office, stress in home, financial stress. And we are seeing that in spite of so much progress, you know, that we have made, the level of depression, the level of emotional instability and volatility, the, the, you know, the, the kind of a number of people that suffer from all kinds of mental illness, psychological challenges continue to increase. There was a study that recently um, highlighted that it is not just among the older people or the working people. We are starting to see this among young children, teenagers. And the alarming thing is that we are seeing that suicidal tendency and suicides increasing. So even though all the progress that we have made, <clears throat> you know, many people suffer from emotional and other challenges. So how do we address this? And uh, this is where we see that understanding our mind, understanding and managing our mind uh, is going to be crucial to enhance our quality of life. So how do, you know, you see that, you know, uh, in, in, in our offices, in our homes, you know, people going through various challenges, worry of off, you know, worry of jobs, 
So we saw during the COVID period, you know, things were already stressful. Then we saw during COVID, the stress level really went up, a lot of domestic challenges. Uh, and then we came out of the COVID. And then suddenly we saw that there are wars in Europe and wars in the Middle East that cause a lot of, um, you know, uh, challenges for many workers and factories and so on. And the economies continue to have a major impact. People's jobs are impacted. So we're seeing that this seem to continue. And and bigger challenge now is that we have uh, climate, you know, global warming and the heat levels are very high. All that impacts emotional state of people, people's health and well-being. So we are living in a world that is increasingly uh, putting a lot of pressure on people. So how do we withstand this? How do we come to a state of happiness, joy, freedom, peace, and liberation? There is another way of living, right? And this is what the Mahans and the great saints teach us. No matter what the challenges are, whether it's financial or relationships or health or you know, the circumstances, you know, the turbulent outside will not impact a mind that is anchored within the inner resources of its own self. And this inner resources of the self can only be accessed through meditation. So this is what the great saints and sages show that we all can live a happy life, a joyful life, free from all the, you know, sugar, dukkas, you know, the forces of, you know, the wheel of karma, you know, live a peaceful and liberated life. So these Mahans teach, you know, uh, taught many people and they themselves transformed their mind into a laboratory of experimentation, introspection and discovery and they left that knowledge footprints for others to follow. So we're going to, in this series, we are going to study about trace back that footprints, put it to practice, see what works, what doesn't work, how do we refine that knowledge for us all to develop our mind, nurture a peaceful, a happy, a joyful and a liberated and a universal mind. So this is what our journey is going to be the next couple of weeks. So we see that meditation is about happiness, joy, and so on. But meditation is not about, you know, sometimes people say meditation is running away from everything. You know, not really. Meditation isn't about trying to throw ourselves away, but become something better. You know, transforming our mind, sharpening our mind, polishing our mind, deepening our mind, expanding our mind, so that our mind, which is the abode that is very important for us to function in this material world, becomes really superb to be able to be resilient, agile, adaptable, and powerful. So you see that, you know, when we discover the mind, we realize that actually that is the true state of who we are. So and this quote says, it's about befriending who we are already. We are already that. I am that. You see? But the only thing is that the material world has, you know, covered our true identity and we take a false identity, a facade, that this is who I am. And it's all material. So when the mind is anchored on the material personality, the mind also becomes limited like all the material personality. When the mind anchors itself onto this infinite spiritual identity, the mind becomes that. But how to get there? What is the vehicle to take us to that abode of the self or the consciousness or something that inner resources within us. And that's what meditation is all about. So meditation means many things for many people. And I like this cloud, which says that meditation, concentration, spirituality, calm, 
these are the words that have been expressed by meditators, right? Beauty, you know, peacefulness, you know, tranquility. So we see that these are the vocabularies that the mind generates. And you see that when you practice meditation, you see that your thoughts become graceful. It, you know, it nurtures these words, right? And you see that our actions also become more and more peaceful and graceful. So this is a word cloud of what meditation and the outcomes of those meditation. I want to go further. Now, what are the common types of meditation? There are many types of meditation. Some of it I have tried. Some of it worked for me. Some of it did not work. So, but not all of it I know, but I know one or two of it really well. So I'm going to give you a brief kind of a exploration of the different types of meditation one can practice. Obviously, the first one is about focused breathing. And this is quite common, and most people who start meditation start off with this. You know, how they, you know, they focus their mind on the breath, right? And deep breathing and breathing out. Breathing in and then stopping for a while, breathing out. And this has some really positive impact. So whenever people have time, you know, I always tell, you know, as you age, you know, you should practice this focused breathing. It has several positive impact. You see that when we, most people have very partial breathing, the lungs don't expand fully. But when we have focused breathing, it's called ujjayi breathing, when we have deep diaphragmatic breathing, holding the oxygen in our lungs for a few moments and then expunging it completely. To repeat that back again, slowly breathing, expanding the lungs, holding it for a while, let the air percolate, releasing out. So there is a flow of the prana that takes place. Initially, the mind is unable to focus on that flow. Over time, as we do it consistently, the mind starts focusing on that flow of the prana. And the mind starts anchoring on that flow as opposed to being caught up by the different thoughts. This is very interesting. I myself have tried this and it has worked. And also it keeps your body healthy, your mind clear. And something very interesting happens is that when we do this, our lungs has so much oxygen that is, you know, our blood is so nourished with oxygen. And the oxygen is traveling all over our body. And our all our cells, our neural pathway is nourished, right? And when it's nourished, it becomes more alert, more calmer, more cooler. So the flow helps us to focus, but the flow also helps us to you know, increase the oxygen level in our body that is very helpful to keep the body healthy, the brain healthy, and that helps the meditation and the concentration. So there are many, most meditations today start off with that focused uh, breathing. So I, I encourage all of you all that before you start your deep meditation, start this, you know, and even if you don't get it, at least do this for half an hour every day. And you see your breathing improves, your body becomes nourished, your brain becomes very nourished, you know, your thought has a sense of clarity that comes in. But over time, you see that when you do this, your mind anchors on that flow of that prana. That helps you in your meditation. Your mind becomes more peaceful. So this is one type of meditation that you know, many people have done, I have myself done, and I've benefited significantly, and I continuously do it. The second one is actually about walking meditation. And this is also very useful. 
right? And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how many people walk. I try to walk every day, at least about half an hour to an hour. And when you walk slowly, every step you take, you focus your mind on that step. You know, and you see that slowly, slowly, the mind as your body is in a rhythm in the walk, your mind also get in, gets into the rhythm. And you see that instead of the mind become all over all the different thoughts, as you walk and you focus on your thoughts, every step you take, the mind also starts walking the walk. This is the beautiful part. So those who are not into exercise, walking is the best exercise. Because walking is not only healthy for your body, for your heart, for your brain, but also for your mind. As you walk, you know, peacefully, quietly, not with music in your ears, but walk, you know, and you see that your walk has a, a beautiful rhythm. The mind too gets into the rhythm if you did this meditation. The next meditation is actually mantra meditation. And this is quite common among many people that do this, right? They have some form of mantra the guru gives or some form of chanting, which is quite common. The same thing, you know, we see in Vipassana and the Zen Buddhist, they all have a particular, uh, you know, focus. Sometimes you go to certain temples, you hear the chanting, which has got a rhythm. So it's essentially to focus our mind on this rhythm. Because the mind operates in the form of frequencies. And sometimes our thoughts generate all kinds of frequencies based on the experiences that we have of the material world. Good or bad experiences. The mind is continuously in a state of flow. So these meditations help us you know, with the various mantras and the chantings and the various practices to bring the mind to a particular rhythm other than the daily, you know, mundane things that you're doing, worries and all those things. So these practices help us bring to an optional thought, not the thought about, you know, our office work, the files that we have to sort out, the people that we need to deal with, the bosses that are challenging, Going back home, you know, family members, challenges, there are challenges, financial challenges. So there are many challenges, many experiences, some good, some challenging, is what Buddha calls it, the samsaric life. So it's imprints on the human mind, you know, and we see that the mind continuously flows. You know, the time you wake up right after you go to bed, by the time you're getting to bed, you're already tired. And this goes on and on and on. And one fine day, the doctor said, you're not well. right? So we see that this meditation helps us to break away from that cycle. right? The normal rhythm into an optional rhythm. So instead of the mind continuously you know, wasting its bandwidth on unnecessary things, one after the other, the mind and it generates the optional thought, the mind's frequency becomes more rhythmatic, more synchronized, more homogeneous, and you see that the mind do not waste its bandwidth, it conserves its bandwidth. After a while, you just get one vibration, this optional thought. And we see that, you know, instead of 1,000 thoughts per second, the mind just has one thought or one experience or one vibration. It conserves all the bandwidth. That's what mantra meditation, the Vipassana meditation, the Zen Buddhism, including the transcendental meditation, is supposed to do. These are all to create optional thought. The same thing, mindfulness is about actually every thought that comes, you just focus on that thought and really introspect, contemplate, reflect on the thought and you see that that thought 
which is a worrisome thought or exuberant thought or whatever thought, you fully understand. When you understand that, it disappears. It doesn't impact you. Another meditation that is widely used is actually nature-inspired meditation. Again, this is uh, once in a while I try to do this. You know, uh, you be among nature, right? Go to a jungle or retreat or be among the greeneries, the trees. Fortunately, near my place, there's a park, there's a lot of greenery. So sometimes after your walk, you sit down quietly and just absorb the vibration of the trees, vibration of the birds, vibration of the greenery. And that beautiful nature-centric experience, nature's vibration that is your the mind that is so caught up with the material world, you know, the dances of the material world, which is unsynchronized. As you sit down quietly after your walk, that mind has got the synchronicity through the walking, you see that, and you sit down quietly and absorb everything from nature, the tree that you're sitting under, the birds that are coming in, you sit down quietly and something very interesting happens that the entire focus with your mind of outside is now focusing on that vibration of the trees and the plants and which is more calmer and more cooler. So the mind synchronizes with nature itself. And when the mind synchronizes with nature, the mind starts discovering the natural power that powers everything in this universe, the plants and the trees and the birds, starts, you know, you start uncovering that. And you start feeling that inner res resonance. So this is another meditation that people can practice. So allocate some time for walking. Make sure you walk in the greenery. Sit down and, and you know, quietly absorb that nature, nature's power. So this is another example of meditation. Other forms of meditation is also actually about permeating love and kindness, loving kindness. Something very interesting happens. You know, there are saints that are so kind, you know, I'm sure you know some of the saints, hugging saints and so on. So much love and kindness that they permeate. And you see that when they do that, there is no expectation. This is unconditional love. And kindness. They see everything as one. And when they do that, that in itself is a meditation. They see everything from a universal lens. They don't see differences. And you see that, you know, uh, there are great personalities that, you know, may not have the kind of meditation that many people practice and go to classes, but they just have that unconditional love and kindness. That in itself is is so much, uh, you know, that helps them connect with that universal values and the universal universality itself. So I spoke about all the meditation. I've highlighted Kundalini meditation. This is the meditation that I have researched, practiced, and know about it quite well compared to most of the other meditation. Of course, I put some of them to practice, but I practice this in the context of the Kundalini meditation that my guru taught me. And I practice this intensively. And by practicing this, I was able to enhance my mindfulness meditation. I was able to enhance my transcendental meditation. I was able to enhance my walking meditation. When I walk, I can feel the rhythm. My breathing, you know, the mantras are not a mantra that I have to chant. The mantras is an unspoken mantra without words. That's what Mahan says. I can feel the resonation of that mantra within me without saying a word. And you see that, you know, the nature-inspired meditation is enhanced. Whenever you come close to a tree or birds or plants or sit in your garden, you can feel the vibration. It also permeates a lot of, you know, love and kindness and, and you know, that empathy. So you see that 
While many people practice this, for me, by practicing Kundalini meditation, it has helped me to understand these meditations. And by practicing the meditation taught by my guru, all the other meditation became more clearer for me. That's what Mahan, my guru, used to say, that you know, if you know this very well, you'll know everything. And if you know the self through any one of those practices of meditation, right, you will know everything. So, very similar to <laughs> one of the Upanishads says that the disciple asked the Guru, Guru, can you show me something that by knowing it, I will know everything. In that same way, my Guru taught me Kundalini meditation that led to something, an inner resource within me. And by discovering that, I was able to discover that all meditation leads you to the same abode. So again, uh, no matter what you're practicing, practice it really well and you'll see that it will get you to that source. And you'll see that you'll be able to understand all knowledge. So what does it need? It needs effort. It needs discipline, right? To progress in any of the meditation that I mentioned earlier, you re really need to be disciplined. There are days that we don't get it. It's okay. You know, try one of the others. Focus breathing. Go for a walk. You know, listen to some nice music and mantras, right? Spend some time with nature. Be kind and loving. Right? So, if something doesn't work, try something, change, you know, and put it to practice. So, but effort is needed. Right? And you see that, as I said here in the previous thing, all it needs, whatever you do, right? If you try to improve your meditation at least 0.05%. Just a small measure. Every day you meditate, maybe a little bit more. You know, focus a little bit more of your reading. Intensifying the introspection a little bit more. Intensifying the contemplation a little bit more. Meditating a little bit more. Permeating the love and kindness through service a little bit more. And you see that every moment, not just the meditational moment of half an hour, but the mindset is anchored on that every moment in everything that you do, little bit by little bit. And you see that if you expand that by 0.05%, I'm just giving you a simple, you can be 0, 0.0, just expand a little bit every day. And you see that you start making progress that meditational mindset starts percolating in every facet of our lives. And you see that by the time four years to five years, you, every aspect of your life will be awesome, inspiration, enlightened, even though you may be going through challenges in life. The scars become stars. But it requires effort. It requires every day allocating time for yourself first before you do anything else. Right? It's like the safety uh, measures in the aircraft, right? It's you put the oxygen first for yourself before you do anything else. In that same way, you know, spend some time with yourself, half an hour every day, and then expand that, you know, that vibration, whether you're practicing any one of the meditation, it is to give you that inner vibration, nature's vibration that is embedded in you. When you after you finish your meditation, you're having your bath, when the trickling water touches you, bring that vibration. When you're brushing your teeth, a cool sensation, bring that vibration. When you're eating a bowl of cereal or breakfast, bring your vibration. Everything that you do, you are in that connected state. And I like this question a disciple asked Mahan that, Swamiji, how many hours do you meditate? Swamiji said that meditation is Swamiji, Swamiji is meditation. So that means that he's always in that connected state. It is not easy in the early days because our mind is so trained to be 
outside and caught up with every day allocate a time for yourself and then expand that mindfulness in every state of our life what does that mean it means having that spiritual pursuit reading introspecting you know that spiritual experimentation with oneself you know thinking in a more logical and you know with reason why is this happening to me what's why do i feel better now why do i feel a little bit down all those things it's transforming your mind into a laboratory of experimentation because that's where the secret is and taking a logical evidence based approach by if i did this today great right so it is that measure that we have i call that spiritual compass slowly our compass is becoming more refined. We're becoming more refined in using that spiritual compass called mind. But it requires a lot of effort and discipline. And sometimes, you know, we become complacent. We cannot afford not to meditate. I'll show you why that is the case. So this is the road to, it says it doesn't matter what meditation you practice, Right? If you put in the effort, it will lead you there. So I like this quote that I, I was thinking about it this morning. It's a forest that is fully covered. We don't know how to, it's just there's no path at all to for us to get through. Can't get through. But every day you walk through that thick forest, the first journey is going to be tough. Right? We're going to have cuts and this and that. But as we walk that journey, your footprints will create a small pathway. As we continue to walk that pathway, that pathway expands and expands and expands over time. A highway to infinity will start emerging. You start seeing at the end glimpses of that light, glimpses of that infinity. And eventually you see a whole highway starts emerging. It may not happen overnight, but you start seeing changes. The path will start expanding. This is what the experience, I was trying to try, crystallize how to communicate this. And this is what the first journey you take is tough. And the first week is going to be tough for you to get through. Maybe the first month, maybe the first year, but you relentlessly keep have the patience, perseverance, persistent, you start saying, hey, you know, there comes a bit, the journey is, the path is getting clearer. Suddenly a path is starting to appear. And you ask, who created this path? Not realizing our footprints of getting, walking every day has created that path, including eventually the highway. So this is what Swamiji and other great saints have said, no, you got to keep pushing even the days that you don't get it doesn't matter which meditation you're practicing. You could be just practicing the love and the kindness. Slowly, slowly, nature will open up its doors of the natural force in you. This is my own experience. You see that as you start practicing this, you get an engulfment of love and kindness and amazing, you know. This is what Swamiji says in this. He says that seeking the inaccessible God by ceaseless subjective search. Mahan used to say, Uttu, Trunoka, Noka, intensive. Nothing distracts you, right? Relentless. See, I've realized within myself, God in entirety, right? So this relentless push is very important. Sometimes there are days that we don't feel like doing it. That is the days, you know, okay, uh, I don't feel like doing Let me go for a walk and then use that walk as a meditational sadhana. Or let me just do some uh, gesture of kindness and see that you feel so great that that hormone starts generating, say, oh, let me get up and do things. So the human mind is amazing. It could reach amazing height but it also can be fickle. So we have to always be continuously doing things to straighten the mind, expand the mind, and so on. 
I know many people who started practicing meditation after a while, they give up. And some of them practicing for three, four years and then they give up because complacency set in. Right? So relentlessly, we need to try different things, explore different things using the same lens. So I, I was fortunate that I had great gurus to guide me. And when I forget, they send gurus to say, hey, nudge me back into the direction. So this is the first uh, message I want to tell you that doesn't matter what you practice, do it intensively, continuously, consistently, and you see that slowly, slowly, the benefit of that practice will start you know, uh, taking place. So the next uh, uh, class, I will talk more in depth of Mahan's Kundalini meditation. Mahan has a specific technique and in that specific technique, there are specific steps and every specific step has an important, profound impact on us. So I'll speak a little bit more because that's the meditation that I learned first and that's the meditation that I've practiced for more than 40 over years and you know, tried some things, some worked, some did not work and I have now be able to know how this meditation that is, you know, worked for me personally. It may have worked for other people differently, but at least I can share what has worked for me and what did not work and for you to try out and see what works for you and how this Kundalini meditation or any other meditation can be tailor-made for you to realize your own full potential. So this is what the series of Meditation, uh, the, the series of satsang we're going to do. Okay, we learn something. How do we harness it? Okay, okay. How do we? If things don't work, what do we do? All right. So we're going to go through this series of steps to help you to navigate. You know, that thick forest, so that you create the path and eventually a highway for you to connect to the universality that is embedded in all of us. Sandoshan. So, 